When I was on the Samsung billboard in Piccadilly Circus, I actually thought it was a joke. I was like, this is not real. Because you look behind you and you're on this massive billboard that growing up in London is something you've idolised, that you go and it's like a landmark. Your face is on this billboard. I thought that was just amazing to see. For anyone who's a content creator or even looking to get into content creation, I think you have to remember that the algorithm is not as important as you think. And you can't kind of get your own validation from your views and your likes because you're never going to last long in this industry if that's what you want. So so you need to create content that you enjoy and you think is valuable and you think is helping people and is fun. The algorithm changes all the time and it's completely different on all different platforms. It's an impossible task to try and keep up with an algorithm that changes so frequently and that no one really has that much insight into. What I know is that social media changes by the day and so you cannot rely on something that is out of your control like an app to be the sole livelihood that you bring in. We always get high profile guests and we get great influences on too. Something that's in the media right now is how do you get seen and heard? People don't look at websites anymore. They look online. So that's why I've called on a content creator. Not only that, is she presents on the BBC and she's also the co-owner of the creative space. So I wanna know what makes her tick. So please welcome Tambi Shah. <laughs> How's it going? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good. Amazing to have you on. I'm excited to be here. Yes. I want to ask you, first of all, if somebody's just landed on this podcast, why should they stay? I'll probably make you question sort of where you are in your life, what more you can be doing, how to break out of a box and challenge stereotypes. So we'll be getting quite deep into that. Oh, amazing. I'm excited because I always <laughs> like to learn as well. And what will people leave by the end of the podcast with? I feel like I'm going to give people a sense of motivation, inspiration, just a little bit of that energy and spark to keep going, follow your dreams and not give up. Amazing. Now, look, people think content creation is really really easy they're like hey I just watched you they either scroll or stay and they just think she's just dancing around showing off is that the reality of it no <laughs> maybe for some people it is but as someone who obviously never started in the social media world and who's come from a completely different background which I'm sure we'll get into I have learned more being a content creator in one year than I did in a sort of a corporate job in five. I think people really underestimate how many different skills you need, how quickly you have to learn. Um, just the steep learning curve of it all is stuff that you're never taught in school and you're figuring out each day as it comes. It's quite scary and it can be quite lonely and it's sometimes really difficult. So yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it and it's so much harder than people say. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm so excited to learn, like, because you've got millions of views. Like, you just have to go, like, your first last <laughs> six or seven polls and it's, like, half a million, 1.9 million. <laughs> like, you've actually learned how to crack that algorithm. How do you stay on top of that algorithm? It, it does change, you know, ever, you know, there's, there'll be certain people you see go viral and then all of a sudden some of them are getting less views. And obviously these platforms want to monetize and soon as they know you're getting too much attention and then they drop it they obviously you get this feeling of i need more views how do you learn how the algorithm works yeah i mean for anyone who's a content creator or even looking to get into content creation i think you have to remember that the algorithm is not as important as you think and you can't kind of get your own validation from your views and your likes because you're never going to last long in this industry if that's what you want. So you need to create content that you enjoy and you think is valuable and you think is helping people and is fun and the likes and the views come. The algorithm changes all the time and it's completely different on all different platforms. So it's an impossible task mm -hmm. to try and keep up with an algorithm that changes so frequently and that no one really has that much insight into. So yeah, it's great like to go viral and get views, but for me, like that's never the kind of end goal or the the North Star with what I'm trying to do. It's kind of a byproduct of making a good piece of content and like you said like because it goes up and down and up and down I think if you can stay consistent with the type of content you actually make and it has a purpose that is so much more important than just trying to go viral mm -hmm. how do you get over like when you when you're 
you got 1.9 million, your phone's going bing, 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 notifications are coming and then you make something and it might be a lot of views, views still, but it's like 30,000. It's like, whoa, that was 10% of my last post. How do you deal with that in your mindset? Well, one, I actually don't have my notifications on for any social media platforms. Really? Because I'd probably be stuck to my phone 24-7 wow. and it would probably affect my mental health a lot more than it should. So I actually have all my notifications for social media platforms muted. Wow. Um, the second thing is that, and I actually spoke about this at one of our wor- workshops we held last week, is that would you rather be well known which is would you rather get a million views and people just like your content and it's short form and no one really sees who you are or would you rather be known well and you get those 30,000 views but the 30,000 people that have seen that know a little bit about you or what you stand for and for me I'd rather get the 30,000 but it has super high engagement people actually get an insight into who I am and want to follow along my journey and engage long term so again i'm okay with the the lower views Mm. when it's way more meaningful wow okay yes because like a lot of people can look at and go you know they they don't get sleep they're like oh i only got this many views what do people think of me do people hate me like it's so easy to fall into that trap of you know um addiction yeah and and how obviously you've just said that you you turn your notifications off but was there a situation that led to you doing that or was it always the case? So when I quit my job to do content creation full time, I feel like I had to spend a lot of time figuring out what that meant and what that looked like in sort of my everyday. And it took me months, if not a year, I would say, to really figure out like, what are my boundaries? How do I get a work-life balance in a job that you don't just log on on your laptop and then at five o'clock you log off? Like, Social media as a job is on your phone. You can take it anywhere you go. It can be 24-7 if you want it to be. So I think at the beginning, I was a lot more present on my phone and not present in real life. And obviously, I learned over time, like, that's not the way I want to live my life. That's not what's important to me. So I've started treating it a lot more like a business and a job and actually switching off in the evenings, not checking my emails on the weekends. And so, yeah, that's something I've had to figure out over the time. Tambi, tell me something. How does your normal week look like? Because it's very different to being nine to five, Monday to Friday. You're now your own boss and you're expected to create content. You know, what what does your sort of week look like? And second of all, how much time do you spend on creating content? I really struggle to answer this question as a content creator because literally no week looks the same let alone a day like no one day ever looks the same so it totally depends on your current campaigns if you're hosting any events if you have any trips um what brands you're currently working with and it can change day to day i'll I'll say there's always a few hours of meetings and admins looking at emails actually filming content editing the content but something like i've also learned is that it's so much more important to be efficient with your time and work smart as a content creator. So instead of attempting to film a few videos every single day for that week, I will just block out one day of the whole week to just batch film and then another day to just batch edit. And I feel like that is such a, like a way more efficient use of my time than trying to drip feed it every single day. Um, so that's the other thing. Like I've had to figure out a routine that works for me. And if that means in the morning I do a bit of admin and in the afternoon I'm a bit more present on online, whether it's creating content, editing content, pitching to brands, that's sort of something I've had to figure out for myself. But literally no day is the same. <laughs> As a content creator, how do you reach them brands? It's really, there's so many ways this can be done. But I think the best way and the most organic way is you focus on growing your platforms. You gain views, you gain an audience, you organically share things that you use every day and products you recommend and places that you would go to anyway. And that's when the best sort of brand relationships and campaigns form when it's things that you were already talking about and you were already screaming and shouting about and those are the brands that have come to me to be like we've seen that you love using this or you spoke about this we'd love to discuss like a a campaign or something longer term Mm -hmm. where you can be an ambassador represent the brand yeah do they approach you or do you approach them it's really a bit of both so I think when you get to a certain size of a content creator you would have 
at least 50 to maybe 80% would be inbound requests. And those would be the brands coming to you. But of course, there's always going to be brands that you think are like those dream brands or sort of what you're working towards as your next goal. And those are the ones that you would be reaching out to. And I always say like, it's so important to be proactive. It doesn't matter if you get a no in this industry, you're going to get 99% of people will be a no but all you need is that one brand to sort of believe in you or open the conversation up if it's not now then maybe next year Mm -hmm. but yeah there's there's a lot of outreach as well yeah I've got a little bit of a controversial question for you here so I don't know if you want to answer this or not but there's a lot of press in the media at the moment and people believe you know the war in Palestine and you know um in that area um there's a lot of things that are not going quite right in israel and a lot of people have boycott a lot of brands if you had a brand that was that people in the media are saying you should boycott but they're offering you good money are you still going to go for it or where does the sort of balance start in terms of hey i don't know when my next job's coming and i'm might get 20,000 for this this next deal or no that's not right to take this because I believe something not correct is happening in the sort of Middle East yeah I mean for me personally I think my morals and my values are the core of everything I do and I've been really vocal about that online so money is never really the goal for me and I'm in a fortunate enough financial position that I probably wouldn't have to take a brand deal just for the money um but I also think people need to give content creators grace online because it is literally like asking a lawyer to stop their job or an accountant to stop their job which is their income and their livelihood um because of something that might be three four five parties removed from what they're actually associated with But at the same time, I think it's so important for people with a platform to use it, to speak up. They have an influence, even if they're doing something completely different to someone else, that they should be using it in a positive way. And if they believe in something, I think it's so important to speak up about it. And I've done, that's something I've done continuously on my platform, which isn't always easy. What do you think of council culture? Um, There's so many people in the WhatsApp state has said, these 10 celebrities haven't spoken about this and they should have by block them and delete them and like people are actually i wouldn't say waking up but they're trying to have their own say to say look this is like humanity what's happening right now and people are not standing up for it so what do you really stand for what do you think of that cancel culture because it could literally ruin somebody as well yeah i mean i think there's a difference between cancel culture and actually holding people with a platform accountable because i think everyone with a platform does have a responsibility and should be speaking up for what's right and wrong obviously that's subjective so that might be whatever you view but i think there's also a difference between the cancel culture where someone might have made a mistake and said something without thinking or maybe 10 20 years ago when they were a kid that hadn't really grown up said something that was obviously really questionable there's a difference between sort of holding someone accountable to that and you know making them apologize and grow from it and move on versus actually holding people accountable for something that is quite clearly right versus wrong and ultimately i think people also need to remember you control who you follow so if you don't agree with what something or someone says you can unfollow them you can block them but i think where the problem lies is that people forget that content creators and influencers are also real human beings and there's a difference between holding people accountable and just attacking them as a person, which is horrible and no one should ever go through. So if you don't agree with it, block them, move on. But I don't think it should ever get to a point where people are receiving death threats or just attacks on them as a person, whether mm-hmm. it's physical or mental, because mm-hmm. I don't think anyone should have to go through that. Mm-hmm. When I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, the algorithms again, in terms of what they reward you for. And although you might be authentic and you stand up for what you're passionate about, some people don't actually know what they want to do. So if something, this dopamine hit that they, they're producing content and it's getting liked more, they're going to do more of that. What do you think that, you know, in sort of the Asian countries, you're more rewarded for doing solving more mathematical equations and problem solving or teaching you something and you get rewarded more for that? than in the UK, like sometimes the more you show your flesh or something, you get more rewarded for them kind of things. 
what do you think of you know because even if you're a good person but you want to get known and stuff you might have to go to certain routes that you might not even want to do yeah i mean i don't think anyone should be doing anything they don't want to do that's really sad and if you're not comfortable doing anything online you shouldn't be doing it like your digital blueprint is a thing and when something's on the internet it's going to be there forever i do think there's a fine line between getting the balance of growth which is reaching new audience going viral and doing things that are maybe not as impactful or educational and then also increasing your engagement and building that community around that sort of educational and meaningful and impactful piece I think there's a really nice balance you can get between the two to continuously grow and also maintain like the engagement with the audience you do have but ultimately it's about what do you want to be known for as a content creator because for me personally I could have hundreds of thousands millions of followers more if I did certain things but that's not what I want to be known for and I'd rather have a much smaller much more authentic and engaged audience who know me to be you know a pillar in the South Asian community to make positive change and educate the younger and older generations versus a girl that sometimes no shade to anyone but like doesn't speak up about things just dances on TikTok and so it's what you want to be known for that is what it comes down to where does that come from i don't necessarily feel like i need the validation from getting the millions of followers i feel like what i'm super passionate about is making a change and talking about things that when i was a young girl like no one was ever talking about and that's what drives me and that's what i wake up every day thinking okay what sort of content do i want to make today what sort of message do i want to put out there today and i feel like i've got that so ingrained in my system that i never sort of lose sight of that that's what is important to me. So what was it like growing up? So take me back to pri- <laughs> primary school. What, what's going on? You're just about to go to secondary. What's uh, Tambi thinking? What, what, what are you up to? Yeah, I mean, I was always super smart, <laughs> super academic. I love trying new things inside and outside of school. And whenever I talk about this, I think people always jump to the conclusion, oh, like she's rich. She comes from a well-off background. She's in this fortunate position. Um, so to clarify, my parents both came from East Africa. My mum's from Kenya. My dad's from Tanzania. And they both came from, I'm not going to say poverty. My dad was definitely more poor than my mum. But they didn't come from privileged backgrounds where we had a lineage of family, businesses and wealth. They both came to the UK to study and they worked really hard. And basically everything they earned went towards mine and my brother's education. And that I acknowledge my privilege for. Like I'm super lucky to have gone to the schools I have, but it wasn't because my parents had loads of money and they didn't know what to do with it. It was because they really prioritized our education and I'm really grateful for that. What were, what were the jobs your parents was doing? So they worked in finance. So they both kind of got qualified here as accountants, started at really bog standard jobs in yeah. like, pretty sure my dad started at like mother care, my mum was at Next yeah. and they were just doing accountancy jobs. But I guess over the last 20 years, they've really worked, well, not even 20, <laughs> they probably weren't working for like 40 years now, but they've really worked their way up and like their work ethic is something that is definitely given down to me as well. Um, but yeah, they worked really hard, but it started from the bottom. What do you mean the the work work ethic? Like, would they do long hours or? Yeah, super long. I said up until maybe the last two three years, my dad literally worked every single day. He'd be working on the weekends. He'd be, you know, obviously he's a lot more senior now, but it is like putting in the work, but also with us as kids. So outside of the job, they would support everything we did. They would, my brother and I are both super sporty and they would drive us to every single training session, every single match, at least one parent was at both. They would take us to piano lessons, like speech and drama, Gujarati school, like everything, their life revolved around putting it into their children and giving us the best opportunities we ever could have got which I actually think has made a difference to how we are as people now um so yeah I didn't come from wealth my parents worked really hard but every single penny they made went towards their children where does that respect come from because a lot of people disrespect their parents and say well it was up to you to do that for me you know I didn't ask you to do that you know a lot of people do disrespect you know their seniors and are finding that that respect is going more and more um your part like your your gen z right like you know I think I'm on the cusp <laughs> uh, okay you know um how, how do you 
still instill them values into yourself that these are my everything they've done so much for us that gratitude yeah i'm so grateful i think it comes down to the fact that everyone forgets it's your parents first time being parents as well so they're never going to be perfect they don't always understand like the new generation or social media or growing up in this day and age where things might be a bit more liberal and less traditional but my parents have always created an environment that is safe to talk about things and definitely given us freedoms to do things that some of my south asian friends didn't growing up and as long as we were honest and we let them know where we were going or who we were with they've always sort of let us do what we want and i think it comes from like just having that mutual respect and honesty and transparency in the home where they're giving us opportunities to try new things and naturally you in turn like respect them for everything they're doing for you as well because they're allowing you to do all of that so it's definitely come with age as well like I'm sure I went through like a really teenage bratty phase (laughs) like all girls do but as I've gotten older I've definitely realized how much they've really done for us and I would hopefully like to do the same for my kids one day yeah it's amazing to hear um so when was your first side hustle so you got you're in secondary school now you know are you thinking about business or are you just concentrating on your studies what's what you're going through I mean I went through a really academic school so you probably only really think about your studies and getting the grades when you set your exams but also sports was always my thing it was never a side hustle in the sense that I was like making money off it but it was the thing that I was spending all of my time and energy outside of school focusing on um so I used to play sports for various levels I used to play like county netball county lacrosse I played hockey for the south of England so when you have passions like that that require a lot of dedication and commitment I feel like that's when I started really realizing like when you're passionate about something you can dedicate all of this time and energy to and yeah I was probably training like seven to ten times a week for about five years growing up at school and that was really like my passion and my thing um, but yeah, I never really made money off that. I never thought I was going to be a professional yeah. athlete. <laughs> Doing all of these sports, um, it obviously gives you, you know, that discipline, that blueprint that if you're not training hard enough, it's going to show up in the matches, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, and it looks like that's where you've picked all of them skills up from. So when was your first instance of working? So when I was at university in first year, I did an internship. So it was basically after school, I sort of realized that I wanted to go down this finance, business, banking route. And And so what uni did you go to? So I went to University of Nottingham and I did economics and politics there. And you moved out? Yeah, I lived in Nottingham for three years. That was great fun. Um, And yeah, that's when I realized, obviously I did economics and politics at uni and I realized that I deeply care about things that are affecting the economy in this day and age and obviously policy. And so that's when I decided I want to go into banking and finance. I also looked at it as a really financially stable career path and obviously being brown, it's like one that's respected. And at the time you just think, okay, well, like a lot of people are doing this, so it makes sense for me. So in first year I did an internship, I worked in fixed income, I was looking at bonds. And then second year I did an internship, one in a bank, one at a big four. So I got an insight into commercial and private banking and then also financial services. And then after that, it just sort of one thing led to another and I got those internships converted into graduate schemes. Then I left uni with a job and I did a grad scheme for three years. So as soon as I sort of got my foot in the door in first year, it was like a domino effect of the kind of opportunities that it led to. And like by going into third year, so by the middle of second year, I'd already got two job offers for when I finished uni. So I never really questioned it at that point. I thought this is incredible. I'm so lucky to have these jobs worked super hard at uni to make sure I got the grades, to make sure I got those jobs, um, and went from there. And was the grad scheme a good one? Like, did you learn quite fast? Uh, Would you recommend them? Yeah, it was incredible. It was truly the best stepping stone from university into a corporate job, because on a graduate scheme, obviously they all vary, but the one I did, it was for a big four firm, which means they have a huge intake of graduates. So you're with so many people your age who are in the same boat, 
have either just left uni or apprenticeship so they've left school and you're all studying as well at the same time as working so we were studying towards the ACA so we were becoming chartered accountants at the same time um, and generally speaking at these firms your whole team is relatively young and they want to teach you a lot and kind of give you the exposure and responsibilities from a young age so I learned so much in those three years so much and I would definitely recommend them as for someone who wasn't 100% sure exactly what I wanted to get into I feel like you get to speak to a lot of people and get to experience a lot of different things that can help guide you when did you start stepping away from the other sports that you were doing so you were paying on a county level you said you know how do you did you know that you didn't want to go higher in in that sort of aspect and would your parents have like supported that sort of side or, or were they pushing you more get into finance and get some job security really yeah i think my parents have always supported everything we do but they were very much under the impression of you need to do your academics first you need to get your job first the rest is sort of the hobby and the side thing so as long as you're getting your grades you can play as much sport as you want as long as you're passing your degree you can play to whatever level you want um for me I think it just became so time consuming to be playing seven times a week when I was in the middle of my A levels that's sort of when I took a little bit of a step back um I still played throughout uni I played for like four different teams throughout those three years um but then I got injured and that really was the kind of turning point for me with my sport so I've torn both my ACLs um had surgery on both and so after that I was very much like I love sports but I need to play at a more recreational level so I can enjoy it and not risk having to get another surgery on my legs so wow what's your ACL so the ACL is the main ligament that holds the knee together it's a really common injury you'll hear a lot of footballers tear their ACLs in netball I um, tore mine twice because it requires a lot of pivoting but essentially it's that ligament just splits in half so your knee just is constantly giving way so the surgery is they basically cut a bit of your hamstring which is the back of your leg use that as a graft so they take the muscle to reconstruct your knee and then it's held together with screws so (laughs) i've got that on both my knees half robot (laughs) literally (laughs) iron woman (laughs) wow um and and did that affect you playing in terms of like maybe the, the the scarring and stuff but also your mind that am i gonna do it again Yeah, so actually a lot of people talk about sports injuries and obviously the physical pain is unbearable. But for me, it was the mental health, like the way it impacted my mental that was Mm -hmm. way worse. So when you get the surgery, you're basically out of sports for a year. Um, You have to teach yourself how to walk, run, even just the confidence it takes to get back on a court. So yeah, after the 12 months of rehab, you then have to work your way into returning to sports. And I think the psychological damage of like doing it once Mm -hmm. it really impacts you like I was scared to even play again and then I did for two years and then I tore the other one so I think I'm really still battling with that struggle of getting on the court like I play and I I play for fun but I play for about 50% of what I used to do because I'm it is scary Mm -hmm. and I don't want to risk and I can't afford to be out again for another year so yeah how do you replace that sort of hobby like so what what else do you do for you know your mindset and your 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 time really yeah so obviously I switched a few of the sports up just for the gym because that's really important in the rehab um but also just finding new hobbies I socialized with my friends more I've got a great support system around me and I think that's so important to rely on when you're struggling with something in your life um but yeah it's just picking up new hobbies I obviously delved into the world of content creation around the Mm -hmm. same time um started a few businesses and I think when one door closes like it does open loads more and I'm someone that's always looking to stay active and try new things so that really helped me to stay resilient in that process but ultimately I will always go back to playing sports (laughs) I'm never gonna let that go yeah amazing so you're you're in the big four you you're you're doing a graduate program you've passed you've got a good job now So where do we go from there? (laughs) So then lockdown happens, (laughs) COVID hits, and everything shifts to working from home. And at that point, I was doing crazy hours um, because I was in my third year of my grad scheme. I was doing 12, 15 hours every day, three months straight. And I was sat at home doing it by myself. So then it really puts things into perspective. Is this what I want to be doing for the rest of my life? 
is this healthy mentally and physically um am I getting to spend enough time with my family and friends am I happy and I ultimately just was really unhappy I was having mental breakdowns so regularly that I thought crying every day was normal which it wasn't so I started exploring other options um I actually moved to another big four for a year where I tr- like went into more consulting work so the work-life balance was a lot better but at that point I think my heart and my head were battling so much with this is a financially stable career path but my heart's not really in it anymore which is when I actually started creating content and talking about these struggles and the process of having a corporate job and being a woman of color in the corporate world and that's when social media became this whole new world and opportunity for me um that I never really thought would ever be a job which it now is obviously what platform did you start on i i'm trying to think instagram so i had a core community on instagram and i still believe instagram is where my core community are and that is where i started really sharing about the insights of my career and my job and how i got there and the struggles i was facing every day and then i think as covid progressed everyone started jumping on tiktok and so did i and I think that was a great decision for me. It really helped to grow all my platforms. Um, and then I jumped on YouTube because I felt like everything I was talking about was so important, but I wasn't being able to have the impact I had in like two minutes. So I decided to make really long form videos, 20, 30 minutes, giving genuine advice about my experience. Um, so then I basically had those three platforms and then I used to supplement it with LinkedIn, obviously, but that's a career driven platform. So it worked well with what I was doing. And how, how did you, how was your whole setup? <laughs> so when somebody's thinking, I want to share my journey, I want to share my story, maybe people might like me. How do you convey that across to the camera? Like how, what do I need? A phone and a social media platform. You don't need anything else. And to this day, I still create all of my content on this one thing, wow. which obviously is an investment, but I've never really had to get anything more other than very basic equipment like lighting and a microphone. Um, I think the most important thing when you're starting out is the message you're sharing, not the equipment. And I think a lot of people use the equipment and the setup and the space as an excuse because they might be scared or hesitant to start. But really, you just need your message and a phone to deliver what you want to convey to any audience. So you're working from home and as a side hustle now, you're starting to make content, maybe to reach out to more people, communicate. When did this start becoming serious? Uh, I think about a year into it. I then started just researching and understanding the creator economy. At that point, it was still very new. And it was growing in the sense that influencers existed, but they were more like reality TV stars or celebrities. And then we really saw this shift between that and just like everyday normal people going viral on TikTok for just being themselves and sharing their story. So I was kind of at that point where I also was one of those normal people sharing my stories, but gaining such traction from doing so that a year into it, I would say my platforms have got to a certain point. I'd really understood kind of how to create content and how to get a relationship with my audience. And then brands started getting involved. After how many followers was, was you at before? Honestly, like reaching? 10, 15,000. It wasn't a life changing amount at all. But what I did have, and I still do have, is like that core community that is super engaged. So anytime I talk about something, I know that they'll create a whole discussion and a debate, a debate about it with hundreds of people because I've got that sort of, credibility in what I'm saying so yeah that 10 15,000 mark I would say brands really started listening and wanting to get involved and I started creating content not only for myself but with brands and I did a lot of that for free for a few months I would spend all my evenings and my weekends creating content with brands that I wanted to support and share and then at one point my dad was just like because obviously I was still employed at this point he was like look you've got a full-time job and your weekends and your evenings are meant to be for enjoyment. So if anyone wants to take time out of that and you're adding value to their business, like you need to start charging for this. Like it is a business. And if I think if my dad hadn't said that to me, I probably would have been doing it for free <laughs> for a lot longer than I was. But ultimately, if you're adding value 
to anyone and you're get, providing your time to help their business grow, then you should be paid or compensated in some way for your time. And that's when I really started sitting down, looking at the numbers, looking at where I can take this, what my long-term goals were with it. And that's when I think I saw a real shift in the way I treated my social media platforms. So big brands actually would ask you to make stuff for them, but not want to pay you. Yeah, they still do. (laughs) It's super common in this space. You're constantly having to fight for money to do the bare minimum. And it's really a difference also and I always talk about this so it's nothing new but between sort of like mainstream brands and South Asian brands you do notice that a lot of the South Asian brands maybe don't quite understand the impact of influencers or the power they hold or just how the creator economy works so I'm constantly using my platforms to educate South Asian brands as to why we should be paid um, what value we're bringing to them how we shouldn't be just doing free marketing and that's definitely a battle which I think I'm going to be fighting for a long time um, but yeah I worked with a lot of brands and I did photo shoots and especially during the time of lockdown where brands couldn't actually do anything themselves because we were in lockdown they would send me their products and I would create content with it and I found it fun and it was a huge experience for me because I was learning how to create content at that time so it all helped like Mm -hmm. build my portfolio up as well is it exciting opening packages up that are free and you're like oh someone's just sent me this (laughs) to be fair I'm at a point now where I only really accept things that I need or I want so I know what's coming so yeah it's great it's like Christmas every day and I'm so grateful that I have that but I don't really get that much like you see on TikTok where people have shelves and shelves of boxes of PR packages because I think that's also super wasteful and not necessary and they don't need that much stuff so I know what I'm getting and I'm super grateful for what I get but it's not actually as much as you think Mm. when you when you went eventually went back to work after COVID how was the environment for you so I actually quit my job during COVID. During COVID. So obviously COVID, I think, was like two years maybe. And I would say one to one and a half years into that is when I decided to quit my corporate job and do social media full time. Um, so I actually never went back into an office after COVID opened up, which is crazy. Wow. And how did you know that was the right time? So, I didn't. <laughs> uh, how, how, how did you, how, do, do you not think, how am I going to support myself? Um, I've educated for this. Um, I've got work experience with this and now I'm turn- like closing the door like how would I ever pick it up if things got wrong or anything yeah all of those thoughts went through my head all of those fears existed I quit my corporate job when I was making the same amount of money on social media than I was in my corporate job and that gave me a huge sense of comfort and financial stability that if I can do this consecutively for three to six months and that's in my spare time I think I'm going to be okay doing it full time. And that was sort of the turning point for me was really the financial stability. Obviously I come from finance, those things are gonna cross my mind. But at the same time, I also thought, what is the worst that can happen? I quit my job, I'm a qualified accountant with four years of experience at incredible firms. If it doesn't work out, I'm sure I can get a job when I need the job. Somebody will have me. Somebody will take me on, I know. <laughs> it's not that much of a risk. <laughs> exactly. So I was like, I don't want to look back in two years' time and regret not trying. And that, with two years' time, is about now. So I have no regrets. And it's been the most incredible two years ever mm. doing it full time. And if I'd never gave myself the opportunity to try, I never would have known what I could do with it. So there never really is a right time. It's a huge risk, but I definitely made a calculated risk based on my income and my skill set as well. How do you monetize content creation? So you probably have a spectrum of places where you can make money. What what can you do? Because you've obviously built that same value as what you were getting from your job. How was you able to do that? Yeah, I think people forget with social media, there's so many different income streams and diversifying your income is something that's really, really important to me because especially when you're self-employed, something can go overnight and then you don't want to be heavily reliant on that one stream. So... With social media itself, there's things like AdSense. So if you do YouTube, every sort of Google ad, you know when it says skip ad, you see probably one on this video at some point, (laughs) will be ad revenue that goes to the creator. You have the TikTok creator fund, which pays you per thousand views, which I'm not even part of because I don't think they pay you enough yet. Um, I think TikTok and um, Instagram in America are rolling out a similar thing, so you get paid per views. And then on top of that, you get sponsorships, brand campaigns. So a brand will come to you, they will want you to promote 
one of their products or service you'll create a campaign around it and you'll have fees for each deliverable you want to do so whether it's stories tiktok a reel um brand campaigns and that i think would drive a lot of content creators income um for me i sort of built a brand outside of just being a content creator so i also do modeling on the side so i would pay for photo shoots i also am a presenter so i have radio shows or i host events i'm a panel speaker um, i can be a keynote speaker so all of these are different opportunities to create income um, and then I think something that more creators are looking to do now is really leverage the platforms they've built to create their own brands, which would be like their own products, their own services, their own communities. So that can also be a more sustainable long term business. You, and you've recently, um, you're the co-owner, is it? Co-founder. co-founder yeah. Of uh, the creator space. Yes. What's that about? So the creator space was founded by myself and two guys. We all used to work in corporate and we met on a Samsung campaign where we were on the billboard in Piccadilly Circus. We became really good friends off the back of that. And then six months later, we met up just for brunch, but we'd all quit our corporate jobs within that six months. So obviously I was in finance. One of them was an investment banker and one of them was a lawyer. And yeah, we'd all become content creators full time in the last six months. And when we were catching up, we sort of discussed some of the problems with the creator economy, some of the challenges we were facing, whether it was we're not getting paid, we're not getting paid on time, we're not getting paid enough. We feel lonely because we've gone from like a corporate job in an office with a team to now being completely on your own, working from home. Um, We couldn't find like-minded individuals who were sort of going through that same shift. So ultimately we decided to just gather a bunch of our friends from our own networks who we knew were in similar positions and just meet up. And I think that first meetup, we expected about 10, 20 people to turn up. I think 100 people turned up to this one bar. (laughs) And then after that, we pretty much sat down and said, okay, this needs to be a business and we need to do something with this because clearly there's a demand for it and a gap in the market. So now the creator space about a year on is a community for content creators based in the UK. And it's just to share knowledge, come together, host events in real life and online. And we've built this incredible community with about 400 creators with a combined following of 100 million so wow it's incredible powerful how do you get like locations and stuff like that to set set this up i mean the beauty of having a community with a combined following of 100 million people is that a lot of places want to work with you because it's a mutually beneficial exchange you have to, all you have to say to a restaurant or a venue is look we'll put 100 creators in the room and every single one of them is going to be sharing a piece of content organically to their audience that is going to be tagging your venue or your food or your drink and that's stuff that you would usually have to pay for but we're doing it for free um and we've built incredible partnerships with so many places around london that we're now long-term partners with. So the NED in London has hosted us a few times. The Ministry, which is a workspace. Work Life have nine workspaces across London. We're also hosting an event in September with Champneys, the spa. So we've gr- built great relationships with so many kind of businesses across the UK that really believe in our vision, but also we're adding value to them. So it's great. Sounds awesome. I need to come to one of them. <laughs> yeah, definitely myself, check it out. You know, um, when did you know, like, in terms of like, when you started becoming a content creator, when did you actually, was there a moment that you think, Oof, I think I've made it? <laughs> <laughs> a few, definitely. I mean, honestly, when I was on the Samsung billboard in Piccadilly Circus I actually thought it was a joke I was like this is not real because you look behind you and you're on this massive billboard that you know growing up in London is something you've idolized that you go and it's like a landmark and it's something that tourists go and visit and your face is on this billboard I thought that was just amazing to see um but loads of smaller moments like you know getting a radio show on the BBC yeah tell us about that yeah so obviously during Covid my platforms were growing and something that I guess I've not touched on too much in this podcast is how vocal I was. I used to speak up about everything, like anything that was like an injustice to the South Asian community or women, I would just like call out and talk about and create discussion about. And so the head of BBC Asian Network saw my profiles, reached out, wanted to offer me my own show. So I had a show there, which was amazing. And then off the back of that, I've had shows 
in Canada and on other networks as well. So it was really cool, really great experience. And I'd never thought I'd be on radio. I've never really had any like public speaking experience at that yeah. point. So it was just a great opportunity. So how did you do that? How was you confident enough to get in front of the mic and go, I'm just going to talk? And... <laughs> I guess I was doing it on my phone at home. But it was just really different doing it in a studio with headphones and a microphone at the BBC. So it's the same message, the same person, just... A different medium so I guess you just have to block everything out and focus on again like why you're doing it and the message you want to get across and I think that confidence definitely took time and even if I listen back to my first radio show versus if I did one now it'd be so different like I've improved a lot but I'm always taking opportunities head on and excited about trying new things so that's kind of the attitude I went in with and how do you get over the hate so on all your posts, people, you know, even when you're looking good and people will just try to shut you down or, or bring you down. It's literally in one ear out the other. I think I've been doing it for two years, three years now. It's long enough to just not even care. Like I develop such thick skin and the only people I truly care for their opinions is my family and friends. Like people who I respect in the industry. I don't really care for what other people who are either not doing what I'm doing or hating from a distance have to say about me because they don't know me and they're not doing what I'm doing and happy people don't hate. Like it's always <laughs> the people that are below you or unhappy with themselves that feel the need to project onto you versus the people that are in their own lane, achieving big things, positive that they don't have time to hate. I don't see them leaving weird comments on people's mm-hmm. TikToks, so. Yeah. And how do we get over this stigma now? So like someone's growing up, they might be doing college and then they say, I want to be a content creator. Um, how do you, how does the new generation still feel that you've got to still have academic skills and, and still skills that you can fall back on, but also this, you know, content creator life is a thing as well. And how do you sort of convince like, the older generation because they go you need to be a doctor a lawyer accountant and if you're not any of them then you're like well i don't understand all of this other stuff and he's just dancing in front of a camera how how does somebody explain that to their parents now so, especially coming so from much. a south asian yeah i mean first you can follow my page because i talk about it all the time and i <laughs> feel like i educate and explain in a really tan like really digestible way that can actually help parents understand that it is a viable career the respect I think is coming because all you have to do is Google the net worth of the creator economy and you can see that it's growing fivefold every year. It's worth billions and the opportunities within that are endless. But also to anyone that's looking to get into it, you have to understand that becoming a content creator isn't taking nice pictures and going to nice places and standing in front of flashy cars like it's not that it's so much deeper and harder than that it's building a community about things that you can educate people on that you're passionate about and it requires a lot of work as well so you have to remember that it's not something that everyone just wants to look at and it looks fancy that they should get into it there's so much work that goes into it but I also believe that it is important to have life skills and things to fall back on I do think it's important to gain experience in different fields and gain lots of new skills. But I also think it's important to understand that the content creation industry is growing hugely. And if you hear about the amount of money some of these creators make, you would definitely change your opinion on how financially stable it can be as a career. Mm-hmm. Once you crack the code, eh? Yeah. Um, how how do you deal with like you know losing people along your journey because there's I'm I'm pretty sure there's going to be a ton of people who are jealous also about what you've achieved and obviously people try to hold you in certain places and as soon as you try to take that leap first be first they get uncomfortable and then you know it comes to a stage where you just have to walk away how do you deal with that I think social media and doing it as a job full time has taught me who my true friends are because when I first started I definitely had people in my life who I thought were my biggest cheerleaders and my biggest support system who were dead silent like they didn't support me didn't say anything online or offline and really didn't show any support for what I was doing and I think it takes that to really put things into perspective of who actually your friends are And there's that phrase where it's like people who've started off in the same position as you really struggle to see you then doing something completely different or achieving something 
really different to what they're doing and I did have to let go of quite a few of those people which is sad but also a part of life because you're never going to have you know the same friends for 30 40 50 years because otherwise then you're not growing as a person either so I think I've also learned that it's a part of life to lose friends but gain new ones and I have also got a really core group of a few girls who I've grown up with who I'm so lucky to have in my life so it's just as life grows as your career changes as you as a person change so do your friends and that's just inevitable Mm -hmm. it can be such a lonely journey as well though yeah on the way to the top you know yeah Uh, I've noticed that I've noticed the same thing as well like people friends and family won't even acknowledge some of your posts and you're like I'm trying to do something for the good and they want to impress the little like button. Doesn't I know, it, it cost takes two anything. seconds. I completely agree. And it's so easy to get caught up in the, oh, like, why didn't this person like it? Or why isn't this person commented? Or they never like any of my stuff. But if you shift the narrative to, but actually I've got hundreds, if not thousands of strangers on the internet mm-hmm. who have never met me, but support everything I do and always show me such kindness. That's, that's the important thing. Mm-hmm. And so I always try to shift to like the positive and, be grateful for that rather than focusing on the negative. Mm-hmm. They say that nobody supports you more than that person online who doesn't know you, you've never met. Facts. And they're like, you're the reason that I'm happy today, you know? Yeah, and I've had like people message me literally telling me I've changed their life or I've directed their career path or I was the reason they were able to speak to their family about a certain situation. And that to me is the reason why I do it. And that is so much more important than just did this person like my post? Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the real impact I'm having on genuine strangers who I don't know. And that is just so incredible to know that. 100. How have you been able to create your brand? So how you look, how you feel, how people see you? And what 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 is it? Because some people say, what's brand? This, this is nothing. It's like the colours you use, how you're portrayed, topics you speak about. How have you been able to create that and emphasise it? Yeah, personal brand is so important. And whether you're employed or a business owner or you're a content creator, your personal brand is important now more than ever because everyone looks online to see what a person is about. It's like your digital CV, I guess. Um, For me, it's something that I've built over time and it's developed with kind of my life stages as well. So at the beginning, it was very much professional, career orientated. Um, And obviously now it's completely pivoted because I don't work in the corporate world. But it's always at the core of what I'm doing is things that I'm passionate about. So whether it's sports, like fashion, travel, lifestyle, that's always kind of the core of my brand. And then everything I believe in kind of pivots around that. So it's like gender equality, racial equality, um, just educating the younger generation. That all kind of weaves into those core pillars that I just mentioned. So that's kind of how I decide what my brand is and what type of content I want to create because it always kind of fits under one of those pillars. And how do you sharpen it? Like, how do you like make it into a thing? So what kind of people do you need to work with to, to say I need these color fonts and mm. colors and how I'm perceived and how I'm sending my business card out? How do you work on all of that? To be honest, I'm probably still working on that. And if anyone's got any advice, let me know. Um, I've just designed everything myself. And it changes all the time. I rebrand probably once a year because my platforms change. Um, And like I said, I've shifted from a lot more like professional corporate to like now more lifestyle and kind of social media um, forward. So it changes. And I, I, I would rather spend more time creating the actual content and the messaging than the colors and the branding. So if and when I get to a point where I want to actually launch myself like or have a website I'll probably just uh, pay someone to do it and outsourcing is so important like I want to have I want to give it to someone who actually is skilled in that area who knows like what colors work because I have no idea Mm -hmm. so for me it's like what I stand for that's my brand and then everything else like that to make it fluffy I'll probably get an expert on board (laughs) yeah what's the dark side of social media um It's hard because I feel like I've created like this really safe bubble for myself that protects me and my mental health to make it an enjoyable job for me. But I would definitely say like the safety side of it, the hate side of it, I think it's so easy to forget how scary social media can be if you put the wrong 
thing up or you've said your location and the wrong person gets a hold of that or you know just the amount of sheer hate and trolling you can get from maybe someone misunderstanding what you've said that's probably the worst part about it and a lot of content creators go to bed every night hoping they don't wake up cancelled which is really sad because Mm. like no one should ever have to have that fear that is just the world we live in and I think as long as you back yourself and what you stand for and what you're putting out there that's the that's all you can do like you can only control what you can control I cannot control what people are saying about me I cannot control what weirdos on the internet are dming me i can only control what i put out there yeah. so that's sort of how i protect myself yeah we had um, a, a guest here a, a few months ago called, uh, called tommy sandu and he was working part of the bbc the one show um quite a few programs and he said that he was just part of a whatsapp group he didn't really check it and by the time he checked it he saw these messages that he wouldn't really oh okay one two messages but there were some homophobic sort of comments in there and all of a sudden he got suspended and he lost everything he said all the jobs went etc you know That's so scary. it is really really scary so when you hear stuff like that and he goes i didn't even comment in the group but they've named me into it you know so um he said that he went through a very very dark space yeah in and time. you have a huge responsibility when you have a platform about what you're saying of course but also what you're associated with mm-hmm. and who you're linked to and obviously when you get to a certain point you're going to have like a pr team or a manager or people that do that for you but until then you have to be so careful with what you're putting out there or who you're associating with because people are quick to hate and people are quick to point you know draw lines between dots and bring people down and I think something our community does as well is like build people up so much and then they get ready to bring them back down especially within the South Asian community Mm -hmm. the support is great but the hate is also there within our own community which is so sad and something I constantly try to change so it's a scary place to be i have to say and i'm sorry if you're at home saying hey i'm an indian here or something you know and i'm supporting you sean and and this message is not for you there but i find it so many you know of my own people won't won't support or or when you call them out and say would you like to work together or do something they won't come but other communities are more than happy and it's a it's a little bit sad sometimes because you think united we could achieve so much especially when you've got good causes and you're not trying to flog or be a salesman or something you know why do you think that is i've spent years trying to figure this out honestly years because i've been subject to so much hate from other south asian girls because i'm trying to talk about things that helping south asian girls and i'm just sat there thinking it would just require way less energy to support the cause as opposed to be against it like it must be exhausting for you but I think the way our community has been brought up or like, you know, a few generations ago, it's constantly like competing with one another or trying to be the best at this. And often it's because there isn't, there's only one seat at the table for the brown person or there's one seat at the table for the brown model in this campaign. So you feel like you're competing against one another. So it stems from so many different things that are like deep rooted in our culture. I do think our generation and the generations to come are getting so much better at just supporting one another. Like, whenever I see a brown girl on TikTok, I don't even care, like, what she's doing. I will like it because I'm like, I need to support the community. And I think there are a lot of networks and businesses coming together to really support our community. I just think it's going to take time. And slowly but surely, the haters are going to be the minority. And like you said, like we're so much more stronger when we come together. And I feel like people are seeing that. I'm just going to focus my energy on those people. 100. Have you ever experienced any racism, you know, um, even behind the curtains or anything with the things that you've done? I've never overtly been like, that's racist, ever experienced that. But I could put my whole life on the fact that I have probably missed out on opportunities because of the color of my skin or I have been used because of the color of my skin um there's been a lot of brands that I haven't worked with because you can tell that they literally do not care about diversity and inclusion and I've 
sort of called them out on it a bit and then obviously you're going to get blacklisted from working with these sorts of brands especially in the kind of beauty industry I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of work that needs to be done yeah um like so I wouldn't brands? say pardon what brands just like makeup brands for example like there are some brands out there that just do not have the shade range that is inclusive enough and they'll put you know a few on this end a few on that end a few in the middle and then the rest are just all you know favored towards caucasian skin tones or clothing brands only using models that look a certain type of way or are a certain skin color and even south asian brands only using like fair skinned models who are really tall and really slim who aren't representative of our entire community mm-hmm. so i'm not saying it's a problem for like south asians face and only south asians face and it's because of everyone else i think it's a problem that we have to fix within our community as well but yeah i'm sure racism occurs all the time on social media especially when there is so much lack of representation of people that look like us on there and quite often we can just be a tick box or a token to make a brand feel better Mm -hmm. where is that line in terms of you know like i saw this advert of ck and he had a beautiful male model beautiful lady and it says to now and then there was two overweight people um in there um obviously there's new terminologies out that's your body shaming if you're not including but where does that line come from because very quickly ck sort of uh, change their strategy because their sales went down by 60 percent you know people it's not easy on the eye for pe- people want to imagine how they look they want to look like the best version and they're like you know and society has led us to believe that you should have a six pack or you know look good in a bikini um but also scientifically we should be really sort of you know look after in our health but you know at the same time you're trying to include people who might not look the same but also you're trying to make it okay as well where doctors are going this is where cancers are coming from this is where you're being unhealthy and where's that line of body shaming coming into it i think it's so important for every single person of society to feel represented and to feel like they can look at an advert and they can see themselves in that in the sense that I always get really sad when I see campaigns and there's no brown girls. Someone who's disabled might get really sad when they see that there's no campaigns for disabled people. Someone from like the LGBTQ plus community might see feel that they're not represented. So I do think it is really, really important to have representation that represents actual society we live in. But at the same time, I also think brands have a responsibility to promote a culture that is best in terms of people's health and well-being and so I don't obviously health is super important to me and I talk about it all the time on my page and you have to be sensitive to the fact that some people have medical conditions that prevent them from being their healthier self but at the same time I don't think it's responsible for a brand to promote being morbidly obese and I think there's extremes on the spectrum that brands have responsibilities for but I think ultimately like the general population of society should feel represented at some point in an advert how do you get ready for some content creation like what goes into your look and how much do you have to think about it (laughs) literally 10 minute makeup look a little pick a quick outfit and that's it you know i think the ease the beauty of content creation for me is that i can just be myself and i don't feel like i need to put on this whole show to make myself look or feel any different you know I film makeups without makeup on before I film makeup I film videos with my pajamas on like I think the beauty of my platforms is that it's just so relatable and it's like you don't need to feel bad about yourself when you look at my platforms it's just like I want everyone to feel confident and relatable basically but obviously when I'm doing like photo shoots or I'm doing certain campaigns then there's like a hair artist a makeup artist there's a designer there's a stylist that could take hours but that's obviously a very very different type of content creation Mm -hmm. do you get recognized a lot uh in certain communities and in certain places yes for sure um but that's because i've really built a core around girls that look like me i think what's the sort of um is there a memorable moment that you've there's something you've done throughout your content creation career that really sticks out that you want to share 
Uh, I feel like there, there's probably a few. Um, there was a point where I created a lot of content with my mum, which was really nice, and my grandma, who is no longer alive, but oh. in Gujarati. And I really enjoyed creating those videos because it was just so <coughs> wholesome from the comfort of my own home, trying to get back in touch with my mother tongue. And I think a lot of British Asians can relate to that of like, I understand it, but like, I'm not that confident speaking it. And I feel like those are the moments that I really look back on and be like, okay, like I was that voice for that community. And I helped the generation like want to learn their mother tongue again, especially with my mum and my grandma. Cause that's like, it's just so wholesome. Yes. Um, and like, I'm pretty sure I did an interview with my mum on BBC Asian Network. So I thought that was just like such a full circle mm -hmm. moment. How do you fit in sort of that relationships in, into all of this sort of stuff? I mean, it's hard because whilst I'm like super confident and super open online, the people in my life might not necessarily be as public and as open. And I have loads of friends who are content creators who are so comfortable just like jumping in front of a camera or if I were if we're at an event, like taking pictures or videos. But then I also have people like my sibling, my parents, my boyfriend who aren't as publicly out there. So I think you really have to find a balance between respecting people's boundaries, but also sharing your kind of authentic everyday life. Um, and it is literally striking a balance between what people are comfortable with and what they're not. You know, in the South Asian community, the, people might think, oh, if I say I'm a content creator, what will his parents think or or her parents think? Like, how do you get over re-educating that sort of side and, and attracting the right partner? Well, you'd only ever want to be with someone that doesn't judge you for your career and supports you in your passions and your dreams. And maybe their parents might need some educating as to what exactly this job involves because they probably never heard of it or they don't or they might have their preconceptions but I do think once you sit down and just have a really open conversation people are willing to listen and ultimately you know you just have to prove them wrong I from my own family not my immediate family but maybe the wider family at the beginning of doing what I was doing I remember they used to be like what are you doing like you're just taking pictures of yourself like you're addicted to social media. And then two years later, I'm, it's a fully fledged business. I'm monetizing okay. it and I'm, I've, you know, I'm on billboards, I'm on radio, I'm on the TV. And then they're like, oh, so like what you were doing was actually a thing. A, a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a lot of it within the South Asian community is like, you just have to bite your tongue and just actions speak louder than words. And you might have mm -hmm. to prove a few people wrong. But when it comes to your partner, I think it's so important to have someone that supports what you do. Mm -hmm. In our Asian communities, you see a lot of couples who are like sometimes unhappy with each other. Uh, maybe they've gone through arranged marriage, maybe they get married very young and there's a lot of pressure on us. Um, sometimes people are different when you move in together than when you're in your own bubbles, you don't notice each other's habits. But in our society, sometimes, you know, the pressures say, yeah, you can't move in together until you're married, etc. How do you think times are changing? What do you think is right? Yeah, I, I can't speak on everyone else's family situations because obviously I'm not going through that. But my partner and I are currently in the process of buying our own property. We're not engaged. We're not going to get married before we do that because that's just what we feel is right. And I think it is, like you said, so important to live with someone before you commit to an entire like marriage. And then I get the whole argument of, marriages and mortgages are both equally as difficult to get out of um but obviously there's things in place that you can do to protect yourselves but for us it's just what's right and both sets of parents fully support it and we're at a stage where we want to build our life together build our wealth together and getting a property is one of those things that we want to do we will get engaged and married at some point and the order of which we choose to do it is down to us and what we feel is right so i think it's a really exciting thing and i hope more generations can see like it's not that you should do this before this or you should do that before that it's you should do what you feel right and what you feel is comfortable as well do you think men and women are equal absolutely i don't know if society thinks they are but i personally do think they are right and what what do, what do you think about the old traditional way that you know the guy's supposed to you know provide them from to protect and a woman's supposed to just, you know, support him more. What do you think of that idea? You're asking the wrong person. Obviously, I'm super independent and yeah. business-minded and I think women should have 
the choice it's all about having the choice to have their own career and their own job and if they choose that they want to be a stay-at-home wife or bring up the children because that in itself requires a lot of work then that's also fine but it's the fact that they should never feel forced to only have that option which I'm super passionate about um and I do think women are amazing I think they can do so many different things at once and I also think we're living in a generation where women don't have to do all the housework themselves either and they don't have to bring the kids up themselves either my partner's great at like splitting all of the like household chores and in fact he's probably better at it than me sometimes so I think it's what works for your relationship but women should always have a choice to have a career if they want to this content creation do you see it lasting a long time or do you think there's a ticking time for when you're going to be relevant do you need to evolve yourself or do you have a a business plan in terms of in five years or ten years i want to get to this space it's an interesting question because no one really knows i think what i know is that social media changes by the day and so you cannot rely on something that is out of your control like an app to be the sole livelihood that you bring in that can go overnight and I'll give you the example of last year I had a TikTok account of 90,000 followers and I lost it overnight because it got permanently banned for no reason we still we still literally we tried to investigate it and I just couldn't get it back so I had to start from scratch and that really impacted my income for a long time until I built my new TikTok account back up and so for me it's so important to bring my online community and audience offline because while social media might be changing the people that are listening to your content and viewing your videos will always still be there, right? So you need to find a way to make sure that relationship is sustainable and long-term. And also while you do have a platform, leveraging that to build other things like businesses or networks or brands or you know implementing the skills you've gained from building your platforms for another brand or a company. So I've always got all these different options in the back of my head, but I definitely don't think you can rely on social media to be around forever and it to be the sole source of your income forever. And the whole idea of staying relevant, again, can go overnight. So you should never be relying on that. Brilliant answer. (laughs) You've always got, you know, some some sort of backup there in in the background. Um, if, If somebody's watching this podcast right now, you know, and, and they're just thinking, I don't know what to do next. And uh, I do have this thing in my hand, like a phone. You know, how do they discover what they're good at? What's their message? Just start. Literally, so simple and so cliche, but just start. Pick up your phone and talk about something that you want to talk about, that you're passionate about, that's something that you might have gone through that day or an experience you've had in your life that you think can help just one person. That's all you have to think about is, just one person needs to hear this and it, and it can improve one person's day and just start. And I think the more content you make covering different types of things, different content styles, whether you feel like you're better at long form, short form, pictures, stories, whatever it is, you have to try it all to really figure out what your audience likes, what you like, what you're good at. It's, it's a lot of it is trial and error at the beginning to really get into the rhythm of things. But you have to start. And what about that person who's afraid from going employed to self-employed? What And what are they letting themselves in for? Yeah, I think when you are looking to make that switch, it's important to make sure it's a calculated switch and that you have, I guess, put the building blocks in place before you take that leap because it is a big leap and it's risky. So make sure you actually do have a plan and make sure you do have an idea of what you want to do and I'll be honest it's not easy and every day is it can be a different challenge and a different battle you're fighting you've gone from knowing how much money you have coming in every month to if you don't work you don't make money and so it's really important that you make a calculated risk at a time where you have a plan in place that you see longevity in and if it doesn't work you know what the next step is. And how do you, like, what is the next step? How do you stay on top of trends? How do you stay relevant that you're saying things are changing, people are going that way, I must do a little bit of that to incorporate, you know, into still getting viewed? How do you stay on top? I mean, for me, I don't really care about trends so much and I just 
stay true to who I am myself what's changed for me is kind of things I'm going through in my life so whether it's like at one point I was creating some content about dating and being single now I create more content about being in a happy relationship you know at one point I was talking about my career in corporate now I talk about my career as a content creator I'm now buying a house so it's talking about that property journey so for me staying relevant and you know continuing to grow and evolve is really just the way in which my life has as well um but yeah it's just continuing to keep it fun and fresh and staying true to who you are so where do you see yourself in five years (laughs) a CEO of a few different companies all over the world and companies that really are the reason why I started this and the reason why I feel like I can have an impact in certain communities like all I ever want to do is just increase representation and raise awareness for like racial and gender equality and if I can do that across things like sports which I'm super passionate about you know media fashion then that's what I aim to do. And there's so many ways I can do that, whether it's bringing people together, whether it's releasing products, whether it's having a platform on a different medium. There's so many ways, but I do anticipate myself being a successful business owner. (laughs) Yeah, well, your face is definitely getting out there. Um, You said recently you was um, commentating for Arsenal, was it? Yeah, I work, well, I'm an AFTV presenter, so Arsenal Fan TV, Um, huge platform, they have over a million subscribers. And I'm regularly on there. I work with Sky Sports, BBC Sports. I was on on Friday, just before the Premier League's final weekend. So, yeah, I mean, I've taken the time to get there and I've worked super hard to get to a point where people like that want to have my voice or my face on their platforms. But I'm only scratching the surface. There's a long way to go. Tambi, you've been absolutely amazing. Um, If there's one message you're giving somebody at home, what are you telling them now? I think your superpower is being yourself and really understanding who you are and what you stand for and what you can do with that, whether it's online or offline. I think everyone can have an impact and have an influence on someone. So yeah, don't forget who you are and what you can do with that. I think it's brilliant what you're doing, you know, such a young, you know, South Asian sort of woman on social media good morals you know speaking the truth um, and you're inspiring so many people which is why we wanted you on this channel because we want our audience to look at people like yourself and say look i can do this this is possible you know if you look straight at your camera and just let everybody know how they follow you yeah you can follow me on instagram at tanvi.x on tiktok at tanvi.xxx and on youtube it's tanvi shah And there you go, guys. I hope you've really enjoyed that podcast. If you've got any questions, please write them down in the comment section. Don't forget to smash the like button and we see you on the next one. Peace. Bye.